I am uh, with Anthony uh, uh, Bobolo uh, from Louis Institute on the uh, sideline of the uh, Le Crawford Leadership uh, uh, Forum. Uh, we just uh, had a very lively discussion about uh, the Middle East uh, uh, threats and opportunities. Um, Anthony, what are the major threats that you see, particularly to Australia's security uh, from the Middle East? The major threat is the is the collapse of the, of the regional order, the order within states. Now that's not been uniform across the region. In some cases we've seen a kind of total collapse, as in Libya. Uh, in other cases, like Egypt, you saw the overthrowing of the regime, but now an effort by old regime elements to rebuild the regime. And in Syria, of course, the regime has survived, but the country has been plunged into chaos. And the major threat for Australia, I mean, there are, there are two immediate threats from that. One is obviously the um, movement of peoples that these conflicts and, and this, uh, these gaps in governance uh, that have been created, uh, that are generated. I mean, obviously, it mostly affects Europe, but we have seen uh, flows of refugees uh, from the Middle East to Australia as well. But more, but more particularly, it has been the rise of extremist movements, and particularly in these ungoverned spaces that have emerged from the collapse of the kind of you know, old uh, Arab states. Uh, these, th th those ungoverned spaces now have emerged as areas for these groups to, to, to train, to uh, bring in followers from around the world, uh, uh, and uh, to, promote to promote violence and extremism. Uh, is Australia's uh, involvement in the US-led uh, military coalition against the IS likely to be very productive? At the moment, uh, the military campaign against Islamic State does seem to be working in, in that over time Islamic State is losing territory. And I think there's a reasonable chance that over time Islamic State will dis disappear. The problem is this is a very narrow focus. We're focused on, on Islamic State. And even if we defeat Islamic State, Australia as part of a coalition, the likelihood is that, un uh, that until the, the bigger problem of the Syrian uh, civil war is solved, until uh, uh, governance is re-established in, in Syria, that uh, Islamic State will disappear and new extremist movements or existing extremist movements will simply fill the vacuum. But of course it's going to be very hard to, to put uh, a country like Syria or for that matter Iraq back together. And of course the same thing applies to, to uh, Yemen and uh, uh, Libya. So the international community has got a very big job in, the, in their hands and a, a, a very um, major challenge. It's an enormous job. At the same time as you try and deal with the consequences, dealing with the symptoms, you have to try and a a attack the cause. So, you know, at the same time as we are trying to kind of mitigate the symptoms by targeting extremists, by uh, giving assistance to deal with the humanitarian situation, we're also, we also should be supporting and, and arguably doing more to support uh, uh, political efforts to solve the conflicts in these countries. Do you, do you, how do you view the um Iran's nuclear agreement with world powers. So do you think that's likely to contribute to, to uh, stability in the region, uh, or is it uh, likely to cause more anguish on the part of the Arab states, and particularly uh, Saudi Arabia and its partners and the Gulf Cooperation Council, and uh, that may uh, prompt the Saudis um, to seek uh, uh, nuclear weapons of their own, particularly from Pakistan, where they really have, with, with which they have uh, deep strategic ties, and uh, at the same time, Pakistanis are producing uh, tactical nuclear bombs uh, very madly in large numbers, and um, there have been reports that Saudi Arabia uh, has made, uh, possibly made a down payment uh, for uh, uh, some of those nuclear weapons, or uh, there has been even a report lately that actually Saudis may have already laid their hands uh, down on uh, a couple of those uh, uh, tactical nuclear Nuclear bombs. Uh, I think uh, certainly in the case of Iran's relations with the West and with the United States, the nuclear deal has been a positive uh, uh, development. In terms of efforts to uh, slow down or restrain the Iranian nuclear program, I think you can argue it has been a positive development. Mm -hmm. But the nuclear program has in, uh, uh, has clearly s even stimulated even further the fears that Sunni Arab states, led by Saudi Arabia, have of Iran. They feel that Iran now with sanctions removed will emerge even more powerful. So I think absolutely the Saudis are considering a range of options about how to, to counter Iran's kind of growing power and growing influence. I'm not sure that they would go to the full lengths, at least in open anyway, of obtaining a nuclear weapon from Pakistan because this would have uh, enormous, enormously negative uh, consequences for the relationship with the United States. So I think uh, the Saudis would do it in circumstances where you know there, there had already been a breakdown in U.S.-Saudi relations, but I think the Saudis uh, recognise the U.S. is still too important to Saudi Arabia in terms of its external security as an arms supplier, as a trainer, for them uh, to risk 
uh, a, 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 such a move which would really badly damage their ties. Do you think the Saudis and their uh, partners in the Gulf Cooperation Council, particularly United Arab Emirates and Kuwait, exaggerating the Iranian threat uh, just uh, simply because of their own domestic problems? I think, there, I think there's certainly an argument for that. I think in the case of Yemen, the Saudis clearly are worried. Uh, uh, other other you know, non-Arab observers have, have argued that perhaps the, the, the amount of support that the Iranians are supply, supplying the rebels in, in, in uh, Yemen is not as extensive as the Saudis fear. But you have to deal with the fact that this is a real Saudi fear. I mean, I think it's also the case that, that this is an important way for the Saudis to, to, to build uh, unity and loyalty internally uh, uh, within Saudi Arabia, particularly at a time of leadership transition. We've seen the, the, you know, the transition in the last couple of years to a new king. Uh, his son, the deputy crown prince, uh, is trying to push through a very ambitious reform agenda, but is also clearly building up his position as well uh, in the succession. And I think these things are also linked uh, to uh, the way that the Saudis depict the Iranian threat. Saudi Arabia and the Arab countries uh, know they've really toned down their opposition to Israel over the Palestinian issue. Uh, but of course, Iran also been trying to do the same same sort of thing. Uh, where is that going to really li uh, leave the Palestinian issue? Well, the Palestinian issue, I think it will leave the Palestinian issue where, where it has been left these many, mm -hmm. for the last few years, which is very much on the back burner. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there are reasons, structural reasons for that within, you know, on the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, there's been a lack of trust. Uh, there's no, the relationship between the political leaderships of both sides is completely broken down. So the prospects of a, of a resumed negotiation are not very high anyway. Um, but equally, externally, there's no one really pushing for it. Um, you know, with the exception now of this French initiative, and even the US has, you know, for all intents and purposes, seemingly given up on, on the peace process. But of course, the two important parties, that is uh, um, Israel and the Palestinians, are not represented in the uh, Paris talk. And that's the best, and that gives you the, the best sense of, of how likely those talks are to succeed.